So this is my last slide. How do we then proceed with some clarity? Um, artificial sentience, when we talk about it, we talk about more than just creating consciousness from non-consciousness. What, what we mean is that the computer has a private inner life of its own. Not consciousness per se only, but consciousness limited by the boundaries of the computer. But to say that consciousness is bound by you know, the limits of an object requires that that object has a non-tick existence, that it exists for real out there in the world. But the objects of the inanimate world, we carve them out of this unity that is the physical universe. We carve them out only in language and through convenience. Where does the river end and the ocean begin? Is there a river and an, and an ocean? Or is it just one thing going on? And we just attribute different words to it because it's convenient. Another example. If you're a panpsychist, you might say, well, the table is conscious. Okay, what if I remove one of the legs of the table? Does the leg now have a consciousness of its own, separate from the table? What if I nail the leg back on the table? Does the consciousness merge again? What about a boulder on top of a hill? This is carved out by, by erosion, so this is part of the hill. But if it cracks and falls, rolling down the face of the hill, does it become, become a separate consciousness now? Does it merge back with the hill every time it touches the hill while it's bouncing down? You see, this kind of nonsensical questions appear because of the following. We mistake the structure of language for the ontological structure of reality. That's where all this nonsense comes from. We think that things we have a name for are real things. We have a name for a fist. Here's the fist. Where is the fist? You see the problem? Either magic happened the moment I opened my hand, or we are confused. We are confused in attributing to nature the epistemic structure of our language, our name given, giving, and the categories we carve out in language, and then we project those categories into, uh, onto nature. So, to conclude, there are no computers. Uh, there are not, yeah, there are no computers. It's convenient to refer to this thing that performs a certain function, but we have no metaphysical or ontological grounds to say that this thing is somehow separate from the rest of the world around it. it the computer is a subset of pixels on perception that is convenient to give a name to, but we cannot carve it out from the rest of reality and say it is an entity, and then ask, is it conscious or not? The only entities that we have objective grounds to carve out from the rest of nature are the boundaries of living beings. Because if you stick a needle on my arm, I feel it. But if you stick the needle on the arm of my chair, I don't feel it. So there is an objective way to say living beings do have boundaries. Nothing else has. If Big Bang Theory is right, there are good physical reasons to think of the entire inanimate universe as entangled, and therefore not describable in terms of proper parts. It can only be described as a whole. Keeping this in mind is the way to go forward. And finally, will we be able, despite everything I said, to create artificial sentience? I think yes, I see no reason why we shouldn't, but when we do, it will look like this. It will look like a living being. The problem of artificial sentience is the problem of abiogenesis, the problem of creating life from non-life. And I don't see any reason why we couldn't learn how to do that. It certainly happened at least once in the history of the universe. So we know it can happen. Why wouldn't we figure out how to make it happen? I think we can, but it's not going to be a silicon computer running on GPUs. It's not even going to be a neuromorphic architecture that is analog instead of digital. It's too much, too different. And uh, yeah, thank you for this. Um, I'll take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, philosopher Bernardo Castro. Thank you so much for your lecture. 
on your point uh, that structure of language determines our view of the world, do you think David Bohm's thinking about real mode and using verbs as the central element of our languages could resolve that issue? Okay, um, so you're alluding to David Bohm's work on uh, the implicate order and the explicate order that has nothing to do with Bohmian mechanics or pilot wave theory. I completely disclaim support to pilot wave theory. I think it's, it's amazing we still keep talking about that. I think it's history, it's gone. It was a good attempt in the 1950s. We know more by now. So that's out of the window. Now, the implicate and the explicate order that David Bohm also proposed, I think there is something to the implicate order. Because unless you entertain some rather amazing uh, science fantasies, I think 45 years of experimentation has shown us that physical entities do not have standalone existence, something that is called technically contextuality. What you measure is one thing. Physicality is the result of measurement, not the thing that you measure. In other words, physicality only arises from measurement. The thing that is measured is itself not physical. And that could be the implicate order. That would certainly go a long way uh, to account for the, the correlations between separate experiments uh, of, uh, of, uh, of entangled systems. The Alice and Bob story that we see often uh, um, um, in physics courses. So I think there is something to that. Now, regarding verbs instead of nouns, there I, have, I, I offer a note of caution. Um, verbs have to be grounded in something that is. In other words, for there to be behavior, there needs to be something that behaves. We cannot just wave our hands and say, it's all behavior, it's all behavior. And no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. There has to be an absolute existent that grounds behavior and grounds relations. Carlo Rovelli, in my opinion, makes the same mistake when he says it's relations all the way down, like it's turtles all the way down. Everything is relational, like movement. So what he's saying is that there is only movement, but nothing that moves. I don't think that is coherent. I think it, everything, behavior and relations, have to be grounded in something that has standalone or absolute existence. And then again, that could be the implicate order. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Next person. Upstairs, uh, there's also somebody, maybe upstairs, yeah? Great. Uh, thank you. Why is it so important that we consider AI as not conscious? And how should that change our relationship with it as we move forward? I'm not passing value judgment on whether it's important that we do so or not do so. I am personally committed to what is true. I would not like to live in a society that operates on the basis of unjustifiable fantasies. And it is in that spirit that I share my opinions with you. I'm not trying to convert anybody. I certainly am not trying to create yet another religion. Uh, I'm sharing a view that, in my opinion, is rather obvious. Uh, and I think it's necessary to share it, because if you start your Netflix and you go watch the series that you see there now, they are creating a manufactured sense of plausibility in society, and we may go down some very strange avenues, like start giving human rights to computers with more than 12 GPUs or something like that. I think that is silly. But uh, you know, if, if people want to do that, be my guest. Uh, I, I, I will not. Th that's the spirit with which I'm, I'm speaking. Yeah. Thank you very much for your question. Next person. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. From all the explanation that you have given, I kind of realized that you see computers as tools, like sand and metal, that are just functioning with electricity, right? But so far in human history, we have never reached a tool or discovered or created a tool that can mimic our consciousness. It looks like this tool is mimicking our consciousness even more and more every year. So under your understanding, to what extent this tool will influence our, the evolution of our consciousness? 
The tool looks like us because we built it to look like us. It's like the shop window mannequin. There is no mystery and no profound implication of it. Is it mimicking our consciousness? No. It's mimicking our function and behavior. To, to say that it's mimicking our conscious, consciousness, you would need to be that tool for a little while in order to evaluate what it is like to be it. And if it turns out that it's consciousness and it feels more or less the same as us, then you could say it's mimicking our consciousness. But uh, as it is, I would say you have no grounds to say even that. It's mimicking our function and behavior. And what role it will play in the evolution of humans, the same as any tool. And it can offer danger, dangers as any tool. Nuclear power stations are dangerous. We need safety mechanisms to, to keep the risks uh, uh, constrained. Same thing for AI. Nuclear power stations have changed our lives. Same thing for AI. Tools, tools change our lives and, and change our evolution. AI is no exception. Thanks. Thank you. We have a few minutes more for two people only. Uh, the two downstairs are standing long time. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I don't intend this to be a debate, but when we talk about ChatGPT, this is a language that uses reinforcement learning, which uses uh, human feedback. We also know that there are uh, liquid neural networks that is also a type of language that can learn from its environment. We have all the learning uh, uh, parts. So, I would like you to clarify a bit, because I know you touched the black and white, both extremes. But there is a very clear difference between consciousness, or I would call a synonym awareness, and sentience. And I like a very nice example, for instance, um, on the AI being used for surveillance. For instance, if I live in Iran and I decide that I like girls, the amount of time I will spend looking to a girl's picture is an information that the algorithm can take, and it can make a decision if I, the government should knock my door and talk to me or not. So there are a lot of these uh, gray areas. It's not they, definitely not sen uh, sen sentience, but it's definitely an awareness. And I would like to touch a bit upon this uh, gray line, because it's very important that we talk about the ethics of AI, especially when it makes this type of decisions. What is awareness? How is awareness different from sentience? So I understand awareness as something that I can make a rational decision, and sentience, so for example, my reptile brain, can have a few uh, uh, judgments, but sentience is mostly related to my feelings. At least that's how I understand this. Look, if we redefine words, we will be able to say AI is aware. You just define awareness, awareness in a way that is not the way everybody understands it to be. And, and this is not uncommon. People win debates by redefining terms all the time. Yes, it's just silly. It means nothing. It's a language game. It has no bearing on the, the actual facts. Uh, but people do that. When I say sentience, what I mean is what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness. It does not require any higher level mental functions. It does not require metacognition, self-awareness, the ability to introspect, none of that. So what I'm questioning is, will there be something it is like to be a silicon AI? And my, my answer is, we have absolutely no reason to think that, even though I can't refute it. Now, regarding behavior, and, and by the way, you said um, it's trained by reinforcement learning with human feedback. Yes, that's why it looks like humans. It's the process by, by means of which we construct the shop window mannequins. So yes, it looks like human because it, it was trained to look like human and behave like a human. And finally, if resemblance means anything, then you start, you start having to ask yourself whether Conway's game of life is alive. It's based on very two simple rules. A, a cell in a grid will be alive or stay alive if two or three of its neighbors are alive. If more are alive, the cell dies or the cell doesn't, isn't born. Extremely simple. You can run this on a calculator, literally. And it exhibits many of the characteristics of life. It shoots arrows, it reproduces, creates societies. We have to be very careful about making fundamental ontological judgments based on appearance. Complexity science shows us that a lot of complexity can arise from extremely simple systems that nobody would even ask whether they think is conscious. Thank you. 